things look so beautifully designed, bananas and apples and things like that, and humans and, and kangaroos and so on. And they look as though they've been designed because that's what Darwinian natural selection does. Natural selection cannot account for the existence of life for the most simple of reasons. Saying that natural selection explains the origin of life would literally be like saying that Mario is responsible for the creation of the N64. What I find to be almost comical, if it also weren't so tragic, are the simplicity of the arguments against God that got us here in the first place. So in this video, we're going to look at Richard Dawkins, who unpacks why God does not exist. Then John Lennox is going to expose the philosophical assumptions within Dawkins' worldview. Then I'm going to break down some of Dawkins' points as well on the back end of this video. Truly, there is no basis for this massive matter only Kool-Aid that too many people have swallowed whole. So with that being said, let's dive in. It is a very interesting question because a universe with a God would be a very different kind of universe than one without. So the most important reason is there simply are no reasons for the existence of a God. So uh, the, the, the reasons against then would have to be you tick off on your fingers one by one the, the alleged reasons why there should be a God, such as the argument from design things look so beautifully designed, bananas and apples and things like that, and humans and, and kangaroos and so on. And they look as though they've been designed because that's what Darwinian natural selection does. It makes them look as though they're designed. Uh, it produces a very good simulacrum of design. I think that's the most important reason against that Darwin has exploded once and for all the argument from design. The whole point of the Darwinian enterprise is that it explains how you can get complexity and the illusion of design from primordial simplicity. So the argument from first cause shoots itself in the foot. Um, Pascal's wager, uh, you, you're better off betting that there is a God because if you lose the bet then you go to hell. That's a silly argument because it depends on, it, it assumes that you know which God it is for a start. If you bet on Yahweh it turns out to be Baal or Thor, then, then you're in trouble. Um, uh, what else? Um, Oh, in any case, even if it was Yahweh, uh, you, you might well say that Yahweh would rather have somebody honest who thinks for himself rather than somebody who slavishly pretends to believe something. So there are no good arguments in favor of, of, of a god, and that's all one needs to say. Okay, so like I said, we heard a lot about fairies, we heard a lot about Thor, and this type of rhetoric was effective when it first came out. There was a power in it, but it hasn't aged well because now we can see the sleight of hand at play here. We have a better understanding of how this is illusory in in nature. Um, if you don't see that, then John Lennox is going to unpack a bit of it here. Also a warm shout out to my friend Samuel Marusco, who runs a YouTube channel called Practical Wisdom and is in fact the distinguished gentleman sitting across from John Lennox in this video. If you guys like this conversation, go check out the full conversation at his channel. Biological evolution, as usually understood by people like Richard Dawkins, is that, nat and I'm partly quoting here, natural selection, the blind automatic process that Darwin discovered is the explanation for the existence and variation of all of life. That's a quotation from The Blind Watchmaker, one of his most famous books. Well, the first statement is false, and he took many years to admit it. Evolution, natural selection, cannot account for the existence of life for the most simple of reasons that natural selection, in order to do anything at all, depends on the existence of life to begin with. So it can't explain it, full stop. The origin of life does not come in to the mandate of biological evolution as normally understood, unless you start to talk about chemical evolution, which is completely different and has nothing to do with selective processes. And uh, there's a lot could be said about that. Secondly, neo-Darwinism, as it now is, the neo adds the mechanism they believe, selection, but these minor changes caused by mutation. Now, number one, it's obvious that selection and mutation do something. Just have a look around this room. Do we all look the same? No. Why? Because there was selection. I bet some of you did some selecting. I did when I saw the lady that became my wife. And I selected her, and marvelously, she selected me. And that's why our children look like they do, but they're different from everybody else. Selection and mutation do something. And from a Christian perspective, we must 
see that that is something God has built into the world. As Paul pointed out to the Athenian philosophers, God has made of one every race of human beings. So that's okay. And what Darwin observed, brilliantly observed actually, were minor variations on the theme. But now comes the problem. Does this selection and mutation mechanism explain all the variation? It has nothing to do with the origin of life, but does it really explain? Does it do the work that's claimed of it? Now, I'm very interested in this. I'm not a biologist, but I have lived and soaked my mind in biology for the last many years. And I've got a friend in Oxford who is an absolutely brilliant fellow of the Royal Society, Professor Dennis Noble. And he is really the driving force between what, behind what's called the third wave in biology. And what are they saying now? They're saying that neo-Darwinism is not fit for purpose. It doesn't need to be modified. It needs to be replaced. The wheels are coming off this stuff, but people don't know it, which is why I've written just recently a major book on this to try to introduce, particularly to Christians, but not only, what is going on at the top level in science. The book is called Cosmic Chemistry, Do God and Science Mix? Now, don't misunderstand these people. Many of them feel still that there's going to be a naturalistic solution. In other words, a solution that doesn't involve a divine input of any kind. But they're being much more honest now, and the reason is that the levels of information that we know to have been contained in the DNA, the human genome, are now discovered as only a small part of what's going on. And the huge problem is that DNA and all these proteins are dependent on the existence of the cell, but the cell is dependent on them. So you get a classic chicken and egg situation to which there's been no solution. And now scientists are thinking much more in terms of the cell, and the cell is an absolutely unbelievably bewildering complex of factories, micro miniature. Now, it's not the fact that they contain information that's the problem, it's the nature of the information. And really, it goes back to this. The moment you see the, that, and it's only six letters, you know there's a mind behind it. So what I am suggesting is that within biology, the evidence is mounting more and more that there are many physical mechanisms involved. Of course there are. The Earth's a big planet. Life is extremely sophisticated once you get it going. And clearly there are variations. But when it comes to the existence of life itself and all the major modifications, it seems to me that there is increasing evidence that you've got to factor in an intelligent mind in order to get a full explanation. Now, I know that's an assertion, but I've tried to argue the case and I put it out there in the public space. So what you're saying, John, is that science is not the only way to truth, which is actually scientism. Okay, so now I'm just gonna highlight a couple things here within what Dawkins originally said that just need to be underscored. So the first thing is this, the idea that natural selection explains all design is utterly silly because of course natural selection cannot explain any de design that predates the existence of life itself. The fine tuning of the universe, the physical constants, forces like gravity, electromagnetism, the nuclear forces that are themselves designed so precisely that even the slightest change would make life impossible. Natural selection has literally nothing to do with any of these. And the odds of these constants aligning perfectly by accident are entirely unfathomable. You do not get a billion at-bats, you get one when it comes to the universal constants of the universe. So natural selection fails at that level. Um, some then suggest a multiverse with infinite variations to try to get around this, but that is unprovable, number one. And also it actually just pushes the question back by one step. Infinite universes means you need infinite design. You now have a bigger problem than you had in the first place by literally a factor of infinite. And frankly, I don't think that I have enough faith to buy into this, especially after looking at the mathematical probability of such a thing arising in just our one known 
observable universe. Second, natural selection does not apply to the origin of life itself. I don't know how many times and how loudly I have to say this. For natural selection to work, life must already exist to reproduce and evolve. Saying that natural selection explains the origin of life would literally be like saying that Mario is responsible for the creation of the N64. It is utterly absurd. You have to have this before you get this to say that this explains this is is wild and so many people believe that natural selection explains the origin of life. So the more that we use science to learn about the reality that we inhabit, the more clear it becomes that there is a purpose and a design across this universe. Design is not an illusion. It is a signpost pointing beyond chance and mere matter itself to something greater. Dare I say to some one greater. Now, last thought, let me leave you with this. Do not subscribe to this channel because only 20% of regular viewers are subscribed. Who cares about that? Do not subscribe to this channel because we're close to getting a million subscribers on this channel. That's silly. That's a vanity metric. Subscribe because so many people are still subscribed to this godless materialist paradigm, which tells them that they're nothing more than a cosmic accident, that they're not an object of love, that they're not a divine handiwork, that they're not something that's so valuable that God himself would be willing to bleed and suffer and die for their mistakes to bring them back to him, back into his everlasting arms. Subscribe for that reason. Like, comment, share for that reason, because if you do so, you can play a role in the transmission of this message that I even cannot play. So subscribe because a day is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We're in that in-between time where we're tasked with bringing the transmission of the message of salvation to every nation, tongue, and tribe. Subscribe if you feel that it could help in some small way towards that end. I believe that it will. You're invited to do so. With all that being said, thank you guys for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video, please consider joining the Wisdom Society. Support the mission. Invest in yourself. Join the community.